where we are in Argentina, on this shore, I can look across and see Paraguay. Want to go to Brazil? I just go a little bit up this river right here. I'm in Brazil. It's perfect. I'm looking for one thing, places where Nazis can go hide. One in particular. Here we are in northern Argentina, and we have found just that, the perfect hiding spot for a Nazi on the run. In 2014, an executive order declassified over 700 pages of secret FBI documents, revealing that the U.S. government was investigating Adolf Hitler's whereabouts months and years after he was believed dead. In these files, there are thousands of leads. This is report after report after report. They had an active investigation looking for this guy. Bob Baer, 21-year CIA veteran and one of the most renowned intelligence minds in the world, has reopened a 70-year-old cold case, the death of Adolf Hitler. All the witnesses are dead. There's no fingerprints. There is no decent forensics. It's the biggest mystery of the 20th century. Armed with newly declassified FBI documents and the most cutting-edge technology, Bob has assembled a team of the most respected experts in the world to carry out an international investigation. We are not going to make our conclusions in advance. I just want to do the definitive investigation on Hitler and for once and all, settle this damn thing. Previously on Hunting Hitler, Argentina. It's exploding. Hitler is living in a great underground establishment. Carata's our place. Did they fly the swastika flag? Hmm. Find me a bunker? There's definitely an area of interest down here. Holy moly, look at this. It may have been Hitler was in Charata and then got up and moved several months later. The Nazis and Misiones are reported to control a system of roadways known only to them. We need Tim Kennedy there on the ground. Uh, we've got to do it now. 600 miles north of Buenos Aires, in the remote region of Misiones, Argentina, Tim Kennedy, U.S. Army Special Forces, heads into the dense jungle to follow a lead in a declassified FBI file that could place Hitler living in this area at one point. Now I'm in a 4x4 truck, and it takes us forever to get out here. As an archaeologist, whenever I look at a, a new site, I try and stay very neutral about it, not get too excited so I don't bias my judgment. Bob has arranged for Philip Kiernan, expert on German archaeology, to join Tim in the investigation. This site in particular is, seems very problematic not to get emotionally involved to it because there's so much mystery. You know, there's so many unknowns. For decades, only legends and local folklore have provided an explanation for three mysterious stone structures, isolated from society and inaccessible by roads. But recently, a team of archaeologists began unearthing artifacts that suggest that this site served a sinister purpose to provide a safe haven for Nazis on the run. This would have been way out of town. After driving through the night, Tim and Philip reach base camp. Hello, Daniel? Daniel Shavelson, the director of the dig, is responsible for dating this complex to the 1940s. Tim and his crew will be the first outsiders to investigate this site. What we are trying to do is to understand who was living there, what the purpose of the buildings, when the building was in use. Does this stuff tell you anything? All the objects on the excavation, all is 20th century. A lot of these cans seem to be the same size. I, I don't know if these are sardines or, or Sardinas, what? corned beef, milk. From my perspective, when you have a hideout, it's pre-positioned and planned. Mm -hmm. And you would find stuff like this ready that's to sitting eat. there that's ready yeah. to be used. Yeah. This was all canned food, canned meats. Whoever lived here could have lived off that food for a long period of time. Daniel shows the team the newest discovery pulled from the site just days earlier. This is a box made 1940. It's engraved. 
and we found inside the wall, we was lucky to find it. Inside there are several things. Here we have the coins. This is very interesting. Uh, there we go. That's a swastika. There you are, a Nazi coin. Yeah. From the period of the Third Reich. Oh my God. See a Nazi coin, it takes your breath away. The swastika, even now, is so powerful. And finding this coin is an indication that Nazis were living here. We have a kid wearing a Nazi uniform with a swastika on his arm. It's an incredible picture. And if you see the other thing, that's the picture. Oh. And we just have Hitler and Mussolini taking a stroll. Without a doubt, this is forensic evidence that there were Nazis here. After seeing that, I want to get on that property so bad, I want to understand what was going on there. At first light, Tim, Philip, and Daniel hike deep into the jungle to investigate the complex. I'm coming to this site with a bunch of questions. I want to know who built this complex. Why did they build this complex? If I get these questions answered, I can discern if it was possible a high-level Nazi could have come here. Here you have building one. It's an impressive construction in the middle of the jungle, made by stones. Look at that. That's the door, and you have a veranda. What's the purpose of a veranda in the middle of the jungle? It's very cosmopolitan. This is the kind of entrance you might see to a house in Europe. For sure, it's not made by a local architect. This is majorly labor intensive to build this. The choice of material indicates that. So if you wanted to build something quick and cheap, you would use wood or bricks. But here they've actually quarried stone. It's a lot more work than shipping bricks here. Oh, absolutely. But if you buy a great amount of bricks at the city, Everyone know it. Yeah. But the two or three, four people working in the middle of the jungle, nobody knows. We have two bedrooms, a kitchen, a restroom, and the remains of the original floor. Blue and yellow tiles. See the yellow? And the blue. A complex floor. It's too much floor for a jungle house. Whoa! It's a real modern restroom. That's the place for the toilet side. So that's the tank. reservoir for the tank? For, for the tank. And here you have the for toilet paper. It's, uh, it's too, too much work. This is ornate. Do you want this? Wow, look at that. The tiles are glass tiles. This is weird. It is um, a two bedroom, one bath house in the middle of the freaking jungle. Adolf Hitler was known for his opulence. A declassified US military file from 1943 reports that at the height of the war, Hitler had a special plane bringing him asparagus and bonbons fresh daily from Paris and he set up 10 intricately built headquarters throughout Europe, with his private Burghof residence in Bavaria, adorned with rare marble and wood walls and priceless antique furniture. We know there were Nazis here, and this house was built for somebody that has a very high standard of living. Obviously, Hitler is the figurehead to the entire Nazi movement. So if that man's on the run, it's gonna be a place like this that he would run to. We're onto something.
This compound in Misiones is turning out to be something important. CIA veteran Bob Baer and war crimes investigator John Sinsich review the on-the-ground findings from the jungles of Misiones, where a declassified FBI document led the team to a mysterious complex in the north of Argentina. Who builds a, a tiled bathroom in the middle of the jungle? If we were talking about the 1970s and the 1980s, we're going to be looking at some drug dealers. But here, back in the 1940s, it, it just it doesn't fit. What kind of Nazi withdraws deep into the jungle, into a fortified compound, and this opulence, except somebody very important? Missiones is, is extremely interesting because if you're protecting Adolf Hitler, he's not going to show up and stay at the local hotel. And to find a facility in the Argentine jungle tied to Nazi Germany is huge. It gives a lot of validity to the FBI reports. With evidence from Misiones now providing corroboration of the FBI files, the team considers opening a new front in their investigation. We need parallel inquiries. We need Tim Kennedy to continue digging in South America. But the other part of this equation is what happened in the Fuhrer bunker in Berlin leading up to the April 30th, 1945. I totally agree with you. We simply go back and re-examine Berlin. And that's what really interests me. Could he have faked his death or not? There's two sources of evidence that we want to take a look at. Two main sources have been used throughout history to determine that Hitler committed suicide in his bunker. Source one, testimonies from members of the Nazi inner circle all claimed that Hitler and Eva Braun took poison and then Hitler shot himself before their bodies were wrapped in blankets, carried out of the bunker, and burned. Source two, official reports from the Soviet troops who stormed Hitler's bunker and controlled the crime scene, along with all forensic evidence. I want to get Lenny DePaul on the ground in Berlin to look at both sources. Former U.S. Marshal, he's done this, manhunts. And if he can establish that he did die in the bunker, this investigation's over, of course. Right. Lenny DePaul, one of the most skilled manhunters in the world, makes his way through a Nazi bunker built in 1942. I was the commander of over 380 full-time investigators. We were mandated by the United States Congress to go after the most violent felony fugitives around the world. If somebody's on the run, we're the ones that chase them. The first step in any investigation where somebody has allegedly killed themselves is to find out if, in fact, they did do that. I've had fugitives drive cars off of bridges, not even being in them. If you can prove to me that Hitler committed suicide on that day, then I pack up and go home. If not, I continue this investigation. Lenny will start his investigation with the first source used to confirm Hitler's suicide, the eyewitness accounts. Gotcha. Yeah. But seven decades later, all of these witnesses are dead. So Lenny has reached out to Sasha Kyle, chairman of Berlin Underworld, an organization that preserves the little scene archives from the Third Reich. What I'm looking for his eyewitnesses, uh, anybody in his inner circle that could positively ID the body of Hitler. Yes, if we can find them in a the database. Okay. And we put in all the documents of, for example, Michael Musmano. Mm -hmm. After the Nuremberg trials, Michael Musmano, one of the presiding judges, conducted interviews with over 200 members of Hitler's inner circle, many who claimed to be witnesses to his final days. The most important question was ours. Um, uh, is Hitler still alive? Uh, could he escape? Wow. And it's all collected in this database. We worked on this topic uh, for many years, but uh, this tool is new. Sasha is the first person to compile these hundreds of hours of testimonies into a searchable database. Which words you need? Uh, let's search for uh, body, dead, identity. Searching. Look at that. Okay. You got some heads. Okay. Looks good. Hmm. Did Linga say he was actually present when Hitler took the poison? No. Who's Linga? Linga was his uh, personal butler of Hitler, and he was uh, during the whole war time his uh, the, the first person he he saw at the morning. He's an important guy. One of the most important eyewitnesses. So Linga can't say that he was present when Hitler took the poison. I don't buy it. 
Can I see the next one? Yeah. Who's uh, Jakob back? Uh, this was one of his SS guards. And they carried Hitler's body upstairs and outside, and Kempka carried the body of Eva Braun. She was wrapped up too. That is why Kempka could not tell whether he really had seen that Hitler was dead, because he had not seen the body. All right, so basically what Jakobek is saying is he's getting it as a third party person. It's hearsay. Wow. Can I see the next one? Here we go again. Gestapo member Herk Mansfeld, he could recognize the body as being that of a man, but could not be certain it was Hitler. He couldn't even tell himself because he hadn't seen the body. That's his testimony. No one did. You know what? Sasha, nobody's really identifying either one of them because they can't see him. They're wrapped up in blankets. Nobody sees his face and said, that's him. Yeah. Unless it wasn't Hitler. It's easy to say he is, but no one can prove. That's my whole point. No one can prove it. There's no evidence. There's nothing that points to either Eva Braun or Adolf Hitler. That's a problem. If it wasn't Hitler or Eva Braun, who do you think this body was? Uh, in, in a dictatorship, it's a common instrument to, to have uh, doubles. You had guys like Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden. He had 10 different body yeah. doubles. Uh, so it very well could be that the body that was wrapped up in that blanket was not him. No one could positively identify Adolf Hitler as the person being rolled up in that carpet and being taken away by the Russians. Nobody. So at this point, it's an open case. Lenny's found reports from these eyewitnesses, but nothing firsthand. Bob Baer and John Sensich review the findings from both legs of their investigation, a Nazi complex in Misiones, Argentina, and eyewitness testimony in Berlin that was used to certify Adolf Hitler's death. There's nobody that actually looked at the body and said, yeah, that's the Adolf Hitler I know. There's no firsthand evidence. I mean, you're a criminal investigator. Have you ever been in a situation where someone says, I didn't pull the blanket back and I don't know if it was that really him? I mean, or the police? It's I mean, it's eyes. Something is a foul. I totally agree. And number two, we got to get Tim to continue to dig at Missiones, look into this compound. A lot of money, a lot of resources, a lot of time put into this. And the fact that there are Nazi artifacts there, what kind of Nazi withdraws deep into the jungle, into a fortified compound, and this opulence? except somebody very important. If you look at Eichmann, senior Nazi leaders that did make it to Argentina, these people had to work for a living. They didn't live in something like this. Thousands of Nazi war criminals found refuge in Argentina, including Adolf Eichmann, one of the masterminds of the Holocaust. Eichmann lived in a small house under the name Ricardo Clement, eventually becoming a mechanic at the Mercedes-Benz factory in Buenos Aires. If Nazis in Argentina could live in the open, Whoever this was, was somebody that couldn't live in the open. There's some Nazi, a lot of money, was scared of something, and it wasn't somebody that Argentina would feel comfortable about giving political exile. This held somebody very special, and the question is who? In the dense jungles of Misiones. Let's go, the other building. Tim Kennedy and German archaeology expert Philip Kiernan continue their investigation of the three-building Nazi complex. After discovering that building number one was an opulent residence, head archaeologist Daniel Schavelson leads them to the second structure, the purpose of which, even after weeks of close examination, remains a mystery. This is what we call building two the same kind of architecture, the same kind of work on the stones, but uh, we don't have an explanation for this building. As the other one is, it was a house. The objects we found inside the building is fragments of iron pieces, remains of a job. It's a mystery. The layout doesn't make any sense. Had to serve some functional purpose, but we can't discern what that is. My first impression of building two is it feels like a vault. It's gigantic, thick walls. But there's a hole 
that's six, eight inches off the ground. It doesn't make any sense to me. Right now, we have a lot more questions than we have answers. We're definitely dealing with a structure where there's a huge amount of effort has been made to create it. Imagine carrying all of those stones from their source, wherever that was. It's a heck of a lot of work here in the middle of the jungle. Do you mind if we look around a little bit? Oh, yes, of course. Come on. Awesome, thank you. While Philip remains at building number two in hopes of determining the purpose of this mysterious structure, Tim heads deeper into the jungle to investigate the third and final building further up the mountainside. If we have Hitler hiding in this house, you're gonna have security measures. In building three, it's high up on the mountain. It looks down onto the area of where building one and building two are. My first assumption is that it's an observation post. Oh, well. Once I was there and trying to find a, a vantage point where you could see, it, it's difficult. Your visibility is limited by the vegetation around you, so it wouldn't make sense. If I was going to set up an observation post, you know, I'd, I'd do it up there. I went out looking for an observation post. What I came across, really what I stumbled on, was far more important. One of the questions that we had coming to this site, these are gigantic buildings with a ton of stone. Where did they get the stone from, and how did they get it to this site? This looks like chisel marks. This has to be on the rock quarry. Cut there, cut there, chisel here, got your stone. When you see a chisel mark at a right angle, to a horizontal line, it brings your attention to it. They took a chunk of stone off right here, and right here, but we'll find a whole bunch more chisel tool marks, just like this, and this, and this, and that, and this. Oh man, look at this. Stepped right on top of it. We have a perfect rectangle. The big question is how do you transport them? How do you get them from here to your building site? They didn't get them out the way I came in. Oh, wow. Well. How do they do it without anybody knowing? Did it right here. You roll them downhill, have a boat, transport them around the river, right to your building site. This could have been completely built in secret. It's a horrible thought, but uh, you're gonna tie up loose ends. The workers have to go too. Hell, Saddam did it. He'd build a palace, have a safe room, and the contractors that built it, they just disappeared. We're in the middle of the jungle. It's not hard to hide a body here. Deep in the Argentine jungle, the team follows a declassified FBI report that could place Hitler at a suspected Nazi refuge months after he was believed dead. While Tim Kennedy searches a quarry to determine how the site could have been constructed in secret, Philip Kiernan joins a team of archaeologists investigating building number two. The purpose of the mysterious structure has baffled experts for years. Based on the finds that Daniel tells me he's recovered in house number two, fragments of iron, fragments of iron tools, it seems much more likely that we're dealing here with a uh, workshop than a domestic structure. After days of working the site, the team makes a significant find. Here is tunnel. <laughs> wow. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Wow, it goes at least eight, nine feet back. It's clear there's a tunnel underneath the house, and it occurred to me it must be some kind of drainage feature, a feature for moving water. The water input seems to be here. 
entered the building through this hole, and it looks like the water is almost flowing into there. So if this theory is right, so the water is flowing in here and then into this hole, and then it should be coming out down there. As I thought about it more and more, it occurred to me that this tunnel was leading water from a higher point behind the house, through the house, and out. What purpose could that be for? I think we're looking at a mill, uh, something that uh, uh, uses the power of water to turn a wheel to generate electricity. Big question, of course, is where did that water come from? The next thing to do is to go up the hill to see where in a straight line that water might be coming from. Philip's climb leads him to building three near the peak of the mountain. That's uh, the real beginning. That looks very convincing. Might be that there was a metal tank in this room that filled up with water, and then the mechanical yeah. force of gravity is being used to speed up water to reach the mill down below. Philip believes rain would collect in building three and flow through a series of tunnels downhill to building number two, where the water would turn a large mill wheel, creating a reliable source of electricity completely off the grid. This isn't the kind of technology that one would expect to find out in the middle of the jungle. This site is producing a heck of a lot of fines. If they, they have power, they have batteries, those are big checks regarding the feasibility of this being a real hideout location for somebody on the run. Looking at this compound, they had everything that they needed to be completely self-sufficient. They had canned food. They sourced their materials from right here so that they didn't have to buy them. Has running water. So they might have electricity. It is pristinely designed to hide a high value target. On their last night in Misiones, Daniel shows the team the latest stash of objects his archaeologists just unearthed from the site. We was digging today, and we found medicines, bottles. Most of the medicines are for the stomach problems. Adolf Hitler suffered from severe chronic stomach cramps and digestive problems. In 1943, a secret U.S. military document reported that Hitler was in fairly good health except for his stomach ailment. And a diary of Hitler's physician reported that his abdominal pain was the strongest affliction of his whole life. Here is a pharmaceutical vial. I can't even believe I'm seeing this. Hitler has a serious ailment, and stockpiles of medicine for that type of problem are found in this building in Missiones. It's something that you certainly can't cast your eye away from. For me, it's a huge breakthrough. We are just simply looking at the possibility if the Nazis had moved him from Germany, could they have hidden him in Argentina and taken care of his health problems and his security? And the Missiones compound says yes. In Messiones, we've got Nazi artifacts, a fugitive's lair, somebody of extreme importance, and now we've got stomach medicine, which matches the type of medicine that Adolf Hitler took. My imagination runs to figure out who else could this be other than somebody very important on the level of Adolf Hitler. We do not have an independent, reliable, objective view of Hitler's last days. And there's so many witness statements that were given. Not one says that they saw Adolf Hitler kill himself. What they saw is a body come out of the bunker, presumably Hitler's, but it's in a blanket. They take it out in the garden, throw gasoline on it, right. and burn it. Then the Russians come and they see bodies and one's in a blanket. And somebody says, that must be Hitler. And how do they even know it's Hitler? I mean, they don't know. They don't. You don't collect forensics in the middle of a war. You don't hold up your hand and say, oh, excuse me, I'd like to get the DNA off this corpse, because I don't know where he's from. It doesn't happen that way. I want to see some scientific evidence, just a piece of forensics that would suggest he really died here. Bob shifts the investigation to the second source used to confirm Hitler's suicide. 
the forensic reports from the Soviet troops who collected Hitler's supposed remains. There's, there's the potential for that. There's uh, the skull that remained in Russian control. The Soviets kept the skull they alleged to be Hitler's under lock and key until 2009, when the first and only American scientist, Dr. Nicholas Bellantoni, was granted access. He took samples back to his lab and using DNA analysis determined the skull belonged to a woman in her 30s. Could have been Eva Bronze. We don't know. It's female, right age. But if we could prove that was her DNA, we are now in a position to say we don't have a clue what happened to Hitler. OK, so let's call Nick. We need forensic science to help make this picture clearer. And uh, he's our only hope. So you went to Russia, huh? We did have an opportunity to examine uh, yeah. the cranial vault fragment uh, that they believed was Adolf Hitler. But the cranium was actually housed in a Rolodex container. And it had been jostled uh, by movement. Um, and it was charred. You could see the black scorching around the edges. And it had an exit bullet wound coming out the back of the head. There was an exit wound. It was clearly an exit wound, absolutely. You think it was Ava Braun's skull? You know, Ava Braun clearly fits the profile. The only contradiction would be the interrogations of the Germans that were in the bunker who don't refer to her being shot, but do refer to Adolf Hitler as being shot. Now, if we had a sample from a living relative of Ava Braun, would we come closer to identifying whether or not the skull was indeed Ava Brown's? Yeah, um, wouldn't that be exciting to be able to, to try to match that up? Uh, and if new samples were available, that would just be great. If the DNA from that skull turns out to be Eva Brown's, and in fact she died of a bullet wound, everything we've been told about the final days in the bunker is thrown into doubt. We have to, first of all, demonstrate just how bad the evidence is. If it is her skull, and there was only one shot coming from the bunker, we know that shot didn't kill Hitler. And the plot really thickens, because that suggests strongly that Hitler was complicit in her death, and that she dies on the scene, and uh, he flees. I think that's huge. It's huge. So we are way far from certifying his death. In a small suburb in southwest Germany, Lenny DePaul and German private investigator Stefan Schlentrich are on the hunt for forensics. We have a very good chance to get good DNA if we need it. That's extremely important. They head to the home of the only known living relative of Eva Braun. My suggestion is that we do a very smooth approach and maybe I go alone. We need to see if we can get some DNA from Eva Braun's only living relative try to prove that the skeleton remains that were found by the Russians were in fact Eva Braun's. If she consents, we should be able to break this case wide open. I think we got one shot at this. You go up by yourself, you yes. know, work your magic. I'm really uh, thinking about how far I can go and uh, how she will react. You right. know, everything can happen. So, buddy, I'll leave you here, huh? Yeah, go work your magic, man. Come back with some good news, man. Guten Abend, entschuldigen Sie bitte die Störung. Mein Name ist Schlendrich. Haben Sie eine Minute Zeit für mich? Ja. Wir machen eine Untersuchung. Es geht um Eva Braun. Hey, 
luck? <sighs> Bad news. She refused to give me any information. Oh, no. It was very clear for me after a couple of minutes that uh, the family would really like to end with all that. Not to talk about their history, not to talk about the relationship to Eva Braun. I was not so happy with it, but I think we have to respect that. She's the only living relative? She's yes, the only shot we absolutely. had? Absolutely, the only one. So the forensics window is shut. Is yeah. that what you're telling me? Yeah. No more living relatives. For here and for Germany, yes, unfortunately. It's too bad that Stefan was not successful in drawing any DNA, but he did it right. He respected her thoughts and, and her family's uh, decision, and we're moving on. Well, we're going to have to go down another road. We got to figure something out. So it's a wash on the DNA. We're just not getting any DNA. We're missing all sorts of evidence that he died there. We have no forensics, no eyewitnesses. Based upon this lack of evidence, it's certainly a strong possibility that some aspects of the suicides that occurred in the Fuhrer bunker were staged. It is possible that he faked his death. The question now is, how did he get out without anybody noticing and certainly getting around Russian lines? Berlin at this point is under artillery fire. This late, in April 1945, this is a city under siege. Been in a lot of firefights and around a lot of war. It would be very difficult for Adolf Hitler to get out of Berlin. The problem, of course, is we don't have the crime scene anymore. In 1999, Hitler's Fuhrer bunker was filled in and paved over to make way for a parking lot, destroying critical evidence of Hitler's possible escape. In any criminal investigation, it's always best to go back to the scene of the crime. In this case, we can't do it, but we have access to the next best thing. That's the forensic reconstruction of the Fuhrer bunker. Forensic historian and 3D artist Christoph Neubauer has spent a decade scouring historical evidence to create the world's most accurate simulation of Hitler's bunker. It's based upon looking at documents, interviewing eyewitnesses, all of this put together, synthesized, distilled, made into 3D images, allowed us to peer in to the bowels of the Fuhrer bunker. You never want a bunker to become a prison. You always want to have an escape route. The escape route clearly couldn't be across Berlin in a car. It just, you, you can't make it. Even a tank, you couldn't make it at that point. So what you want to do is like any sort of rodent, you want to go underground and appear someplace else. There's a massive web of tunnels that are underneath Berlin that go in all different directions. There's four exits to the Fuhrer bunker. What intrigues me the most are exits number two, and four. They both make their way to uh, underground tunnels. What we need to do now really is to get Lenny DePaul over there. Is there a way for him to get out of Berlin via this massive web of tunnels? Yep, I like it. This is it? Right here? That's the entrance. Wow. Yeah. Please help me here. To give Lenny a sense of the massive scale of the tunnel system built under Hitler's regime, Sasha accesses a rarely seen section of Berlin's underground. Boy, this is really tucked away in nowhere. So this isn't open to the public? Nobody goes down here? Nobody knows. So they cannot go down here. Wow. The neighbors don't know it's a hidden place. Let's go, man. This is exciting to take a look at what the possible resources that Adolf Hitler could have had gives me a great idea as a fugitive investigator on what was at his disposal and how he could have used them. Yes. OK. Yep. Wow. Woo. That's quite a drop. Look at that. How many of these tunnels exist under Berlin? Hundreds of kilometers, connecting every important infrastructure and point beneath the city. For example, train stations and airports. 
When was this tunnel built, or tunnels like this? In the early 30s, Hitler's plans were the bigger the better. And he planned to rebuild Berlin to the world capital. To bring millions of people, for example, to the palace of Hitler, you need a traffic system. Because of that, perhaps, it was a certain friendship with Albert Speer, his famous architect. Many nights and days they sat together and uh, planned the new world capital. Wow. Under Nazi rule, Berlin's underground was expanded into a sprawling web of 93 miles of interconnected tunnels and bunkers. This multi-storied underground had independent power, heating, and ventilation. Hitler and Albert Speer built this city beneath the city to move hundreds of thousands of people efficiently throughout Berlin. But once the war was lost, these tunnels provided Nazis with safe shelter and a means of escape. Look how dark it is. Shut your light off. And these tunnels go for miles. The Russians had no map to know uh, where the tunnels went. They knew the buildings and the streets, but not the subway system. So they had no idea that the, that the underground world existed in Berlin. They had an idea that uh, it is existing, but not at which track or line. Wow. Boy, what a perfect escape route. In a subterranean environment like this, not knowing the lay of the land, uh, it would be hell trying to find somebody. You could get lost for days, probably weeks down here. So you're up against it. It's dark, you don't know where you're going, and the people you're looking for are armed and extremely dangerous. What a perfect place for Hitler and Eva Braun to escape in. With kilometers of tunnels, why a dictator with a vision of the world power commits suicide. Yeah, makes no sense. He has another focus and bigger plans. There's no reason to commit suicide knowing the Russians were not going to come down there. Why would he kill himself? So was he able to escape and get out of Berlin? We're going to find out. Next time on Hunting Hitler. German submarine? That's the way I'd get there. Underwater, there's no way to detect these things. Where there's smoke, there's fire. Three crew members clearly saw a submarine emerge and submerge. What happened to the sub? I don't know. Need to find out where this leads. Look at this. Adolf Hitler, his mindset was escape, escape, escape. He's going to do whatever it takes. Do you think Adolf Hitler was on one of these submarines? As if a king had arrived. As if a king. Oh, man, I got something right here. Holy <laughs> Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. There's not sufficient evidence that Hitler died in the bunker in April 30th, 1945. Could Adolf Hitler have gotten out of Berlin, and how did he do it? How did he enter Argentina? We're going to look at who could facilitate hiding Hitler.